Okay, I'm gonna try and recite the Litany Against Fear off by heart because I think I have it memorized. I could be wrong. And of course, we have to say it like a Timothée Chalamet. We have to get in character. I must not fear. Fear is the mind killer. Fear is the little death that brings total obliteration. I will face my fear. I will permit it to pass over me and through me. And when it has gone past, I will turn the inner eye to see its path. Where the fear is gone, there will be nothing. Only I will remain. I think I'm, I think that's right. God, I'm such a nerd. So today I'm going to be reviewing Dune. I have talked about this book before in my first video where I was talking about the Denis Villeneuve reboot. I've got to say, having read it, well, slash listened to it a second time, I've listened to it on Audible. Uh, I wish they'd sponsor me. I mean, that'd be great. If, the day I get sponsored by Audible is the day I die happy, because I mean, like, Audible's great. Anyways, I have gone through Dune twice now, and it's kind of a good thing that I've gone through it twice, because, I mean, I literally picked up so much more this time around. Like, the first time I read the book, I was like, yeah, it's good. I, I quite like it. This time around, I was like, oh, this book is really good. How did I miss all this stuff? So yes, right off the bat, Dune is a very good book. It's a very heady book, and there's a lot to unpack in it. On the surface, it's the hero's journey of Paul Atreides, son of Duke Leto Atreides. He allies with the Fremen to get revenge against House Harkonnen, who was responsible in the death of his father. He becomes the messianic figure of Muad'Dib. Him and the Fremen work together to overthrow the Emperor of the Known Universe, and Paul becomes the Emperor of the Known Universe. And all whilst this is going on, Paul is learning to control his prescient powers, which was a result of him being the Kwisatz Haderach, a super being made by the Bene Gesserit. Now, I say on the surface because if you read the book closely and you get to the end, you realise that Paul Atreides is not necessarily the hero of the story. Yes, he's the protagonist of the story and we see the story through his eyes, but at the end of the day, Paul Atreides doesn't really become a great person. Now, whilst I like the writing style of the book, I will say Frank Herbert as an author isn't the most accessible when it comes to explaining the world to his audience. He sort of just throws you in the thick of it. Herbert uses a lot of terminology that he doesn't necessarily explain to the reader, so you have to either A, read the glossary, B, just sort of go with it, or C, just be really confused. Like, he just opens the book, throws you into the world, and he's just like, oh, the Benny Jester Order, uh, the, the Glow Globes, and the Kwisaz Haderach, and you're just like, huh? What is all this? Frank Herbert also writes the book in an omniscient point of view, which is essentially, he'll like, have a scene with a bunch of characters, you'll start off in the point of view of one character, and then mid-paragraph, he will change to the perspective of another character, which basically gives you all their inner thoughts and feelings. In a lot of ways, this book is a screenwriter or director's biggest dream, because literally all the character motivations and thoughts and feelings are all just sort of blurted on the page, so you literally just go through it and you go, oh, I know what this character's about, I know what they're feeling here, I know what this character's all about, I know what they're feeling here. It's kind of great. That being said, there are a handful of chapters that feel quite superfluous because it's just the inner thoughts of a character. For example, the death of Liet Kynes to me was kind of boring and kind of pointless because all it was was Liet Kynes walking through the desert, dehydrated, hallucinating about his father, and that's kind of it. Oh, and ecology. He keeps going on about ecology a lot. That being said, Frank Herbert's attention to detail is insane and I kind of love it because Every line is filled with dense information that's either world building, character development, a character's thoughts or feelings, and in a lot of ways there's excellent foreshadowing. My favourite piece of foreshadowing is actually in the Gom Jabar scene where the Reverend Mother is looking at Paul and goes, ah, oh, he has the eyes of the old Duke, blah blah blah, the paternal grandfather. And then she looks at his brow and goes, oh, but he has the brow of the maternal grandfather who shall not be named. Basically hinting that Lady Jessica is the daughter of the Baron Harkonnen and is Paul's grandfather. Like. I love that detail so much, it's so subtle and you have to have read the book, but once you actually go back and you reread the book, you're like, oh, that is, that is so good. Like, that is excellent foreshadowing. So we get to the characters and Paul Atreides is a serviceable lead for this book, but like I said before, he is a bit of a blank slate. Now, he does have moments where he is young and enthusiastic and wide-eyed and witty, but that's mainly in scenes where he's surrounded by close friends like Gurney Halleck or Duncan Idaho, or his father or mother. Other than that, it seems like Paul is just the quiet kid who stands in the corner reserved, not really talking unless he's spoken to. Now, despite his blank slate nature, I will say Paul's character arc is actually quite interesting. In a lot of ways, Paul becoming the messiah for the Fremen it's just an elaborate con that he and Lady Jessica concoct. They just end up tricking the Fremen that Paul is the destined Kwisatz Haderach, although he is the Kwisatz Haderach because he gains the prescient powers, but Lady Jessica explicitly fits it into the Fremen prophecy, 
essentially tricking the Fremen into going, hey, look, Paul is the Kwisar Tadrak, he is the Muad'Dib, follow him. And then at the end of part three, remember this book is split into three parts. Part one is Dune, part two is Muad'Dib, and part three is the Prophet. Paul's sudden turn where he becomes a lot more cold and calculating foreshadows his dictator-like tendencies that will manifest in Dune Messiah. Another thing that I also find quite interesting is that Frank Herbert writes prescience like it isn't a very useful power. There's an outline of the future that you can see, but it's always ever-changing. In a way, it actually reminds me of a quote from The Matrix where Morpheus tells Neo that there's a difference between knowing the path and walking the path. Now, Lady Jessica is one of my favourite characters in the novel. She is the most important character in the Dune saga because all of her actions lead into the, the story. Without Lady Jessica, there is no Dune saga. If she didn't betray the Bene Gesserit sisterhood and had a daughter before that would then marry a Harkonnen heir, Paul wouldn't happen, the Kwisatz Haderach wouldn't happen, the Fremen uprising in Arrakis wouldn't happen because Paul Atreides wouldn't exist. And then of course if Paul doesn't exist, the rest of the saga doesn't exist, and if anything that might have been a good thing. And of course Jessica is smart and intelligent and empathetic, and overall she is a great well-rounded character. Now we get to Duke Lesser Atreides, and I like the Duke Lesser Atreides, in many ways he's like the Ned Stark of the Dune universe, he is the honourable, compassionate lord that everybody loves and is incredibly popular. But in earlier videos when I talked about Dune, I remember saying that I I thought the Duke was a bit cold, and this time around, he's a lot warmer than I remembered. In fact, he feels a lot more haggard and tired. That might just be because of the way the narrator reads the lines in the audiobook, but just, he seems a lot more just, okay, I am the Duke. I am powerful, but also, I don't like responsibility, but I have to because it's my duty. It's that kind of thing. It is just pretty much Ned Stark. Or if anything, Ned Stark is like Duke Lesser Atreides. But also his relationship with Paul is a little more tender than I remembered it being. I remembered it being super cold and distant when I first read it, but just, it's not really like that. It's more just sort of like a son, I can't show a lot of affection to you right now because I'm being the Duke and I have to keep up a certain image. I hope you understand that. And I like that, but again, I do feel like they are missing a couple of personal scenes together. Though I do actually find it quite interesting how Paul regards his father as quite important, but then the further you get into the Dune saga, you realise Paul kind of just isn't anything like his father at all, and he really just gets corrupted. Now, Gurney Halleck is a lot more wittier than I remembered. I don't know if it's just because I have the Patrick Stewart and the Josh Brolin versions ingrained in my brain where they're a lot more serious and to the point, but I forgot that Gurney is witty and silly sometimes. Like when he's singing that dirty song in the ballet set, or him and Paul are just like talking like older brother, younger brother. It's really interesting. I didn't remember that the first time around, and just... I find it funny how the different adaptations have sort of changed Gurney a little bit into being more serious and grim and dark. The Baron Harkonnen is just evil. Frank Herbert isn't very subtle about it, he is just evil. He's fat, he's greedy, he's disgusting, he's a pedophile. Like, Frank Herbert literally just went, I'm going to write an evil character and that's it. He is just meant to be cruel and evil for the sake of being cruel and evil so that when Paul teams up with the Fremen, who have essentially been enslaved and beaten and tortured by the Harkonnens, you're all for it, you're like, okay, Paul, you and the Fremen, go kill him because he is just the worst. And another detail that I sort of forgot about was that the Baron Harkonnen likes raping little boys that look like Paul Atreides, which is just, it's interesting to me because it's, it's a detail that isn't necessary to his character at all because he's already horrific and despicable, but just, it's, it's definitely a, a writer's thing where it's kind of like, I like that attention to detail, it's not necessary, and it is also very grim and dark, but there's a there's a dark, twisted nature to it that's kind of interesting. But then also, Frank Herbert doesn't really do anything with it. It kind of is just like a throwaway line that we just get into the Baron's psyche to go, ugh, the Baron is gross. Now, speaking of the rest of House Harkonnen, Paisa de Vries and Raban are kind of like nothing secondary tertiary characters. Like, in a lot of ways, I don't get why the 2021 film is hyping them up, because I mean, Paita is an interesting character, but dies a third of the way through the book. And then Raban is like a very in-the-back background character that doesn't really do a lot, and pretty much gets overshadowed by Fader Altha. Like, the most important secondary character in House Harkonnen is Fader Altha. And what's interesting is that Fader Altha isn't in Dune Part 1, but the beast Raban is, but Raban is also kind of a useless character. So what I think Denis Villeneuve and company have done is they've given most of Fade's stuff from the beginning of the book, where it's Fade and the Baron talking and scheming, they've given that to the Baron and Raban, so that when Dune Part 2 comes along, they can introduce Fade Rautha in a badass way, and it's gonna be awesome and epic. And then I'm guessing Raban is gonna get killed unceremoniously in Part 2, because I mean, that's kind of what happens to Raban in the book, he just, like, gets killed. But now that I'm onto him, Fade Rautha is a cool side character, he's like, the secondary tertiary villain of the book, 
he is just so cool. He's just as despicable as the Baron, but also the thing that I just completely forgot about was his introduction chapter. Okay, I say introductory chapter, he is in the beginning of the book, but the chapter where Fade Rather becomes, you know, a main player in the Dune book is this scene where he is essentially fighting in a gladiatorial arena, and it's awesome. It's just super cinematic, and it just reveals so much about his character, the way he toys with that berserker slave, it's just so great, and I think Denis Villeneuve, when he gets to adapting this in Dune Part 2, is going to have so much fun, because you essentially have to make a badass opening gladiatorial fight. Like, you essentially get to make elements of Gladiator in Dune, and it just, it's going to be awesome, and Fade is just cool. His tricks are like quality, his arrogance, Fade is just awesome, and I love Sting's portrayal of it, so it's just... Fade's a great character. Now, a character I completely forgot all about is Count Fenring. I don't know how this completely slipped my mind since he is kind of important because he's a failed Kwisatz Haderach, but also he is the one that allows Paul Atreides to survive at the end. After Paul beats Fade in that duel, the Emperor's like, Fenring, go kill Paul. And it's funny because in the narration, Fenring could have killed Paul. He's literally just like, yeah, I could kill him, but I'm not going to. It's really interesting because he essentially abdicates Shaddam IV from the throne and allows Paul to become the Emperor all throughout the kindness of his heart because he knows what the throne is doing to his friend. Now, Dr. Yue is a very well done tragic character, but I have to say he is an idiot. His plan is incredibly idiotic. I don't actually understand why he betrays the Atreides. Like, yes, he wants to kill the Baron Harkonnen, but his plan is just dumb because, I mean, he gets the Duke Leto killed. I mean, yes, he betrays the Atreides by breaking through his Imperial conditioning, but if I'm Dr. Yue and I want the Baron Harkonnen dead for killing my wife, I wouldn't go and betray my Duke Leto Atreides. I would be like, hey, my Duke, I have a plan. Let's go and attack the Baron Harkonnen. But don't have your plan involve the death of the Duke, that makes no sense. Like, his plan is just idiotic and dumb, and yes, like I said, Yue is a tragic character and it works well for the plot of the book, because if Yue doesn't betray the Atreides, then, you know, there is no story. But it's kind of like, come on, Yue, if you're thinking logical, if you really wanted to kill the Baron, you know, killing Duke Leto is not the best way to do it. Also, the thing that I just find very funny is how the first third of the book is basically everyone in House of Trade is going, there's a spy in our midst, I think it's Lady Jessica, I think it's Thufir Howard, I think it's Duncan Idaho. But realistically, Yue is the obvious candidate for, like, for being the traitor. Like, Jessica has multiple conversations with Yue where she's like, oh, he's hiding something, he's not opening up to me. And I'm like, yes, Jessica, it's because he is the traitor. And then, of course, you have the rest of the supporting cast, like Duncan, Idaho, Leah, Kine, Stilgar, Chaney. They're all fine, but they all just feel sort of like stereotypes in a way. I mean, Chaney is just meant to be the love interest. She doesn't really have a lot of personality. Like, yes, of course, her personality comes from her being a Fremen woman, but just other than that, she doesn't really have much to do in the book. Oh, and Leah is my favourite character. I love her so much. The fact that she is just a toddler walking around with the mind of, like, a thousand Reverend Mothers in her brain, basically making her, like, a fully grown adult in a child's body is so cool, and the way she kills the Baron Harkonnen is awesome. Like, she stabs the Baron Harkonnen with a gom bar. She's all like, have fun dying, Grandfather. It's the best. I love it so much. I'm actually about a third of the way through Children of Dune, and I've watched Quinn's Idea's first three videos on the entire Dune saga explained, and listening to him explain what happens in Children of Dune, I won't lie, like, what happens to Aaliyah is really sad. But in summary, I have to say, I actually enjoyed the first half of the book a lot more than I remembered, because the first time, I remember it just being a bunch of conversations between people, and I was like, okay, I get it, can we get to something, like, actually, like, exciting? And to be fair, I can understand why I thought that, because, I mean, a lot of the first third of the book is just people talking, a lot of political machinations, and a lot of people just going, oh, there's a traitor amongst House of Trades. Funnily enough, I actually think this time around, the last bit of the book is actually a little bit underdeveloped. Like, Paul and Jessica, they get to the Fremen, they meet Stilgar, they meet Chaney, they become accepted as part of the tribe, you know, Paul fights Jamis, and it's really cool. Like, I actually think we needed to see a bit more of Paul and Jessica bonding with the Fremen instead of skipping five years, to Paul learning to ride, you know, Shai Hulud, becoming the, the Worm Rider and the Muad'Dib. I actually do think we needed a bit more time with him and Jessica just hanging out with the Fremen people, learning their culture. But I will say, I actually do think there's a lot of great payoff in the third act of the book. Like, when Paul reunites with Gurney, he takes him back to the Fremen household, and then Gurney tries to assassinate Lady Jessica. Like, that stuff was great, and it's one of my favourites because it's so tense. Gurney thinks Jessica betrayed House Atreides and was the one that got Duke Leto killed, but in fact it was Yue, and it was just, 
It's such a cool turn of events. And of course, the last third of the book is mostly action, but I will say, I don't think Frank Herbert actually likes to write big scale action, because unless I've forgotten something, he doesn't really, you know, write about the action scenes. He kind of brushes over it. The big battle between the Harkonnens, the Sardaukar, and the Fremen, it's just glanced over. Like, did I miss the chapter where Paul rides in on the sandworms and takes out the whole Sardaukar and the Harkonnens? Like, because from what I remember, it's just Paul and Stilgar and Gurney are talking about battle tactics. And then the chapter ends with them finding out that Paul's son, Duke Leto II, is dead. And then it suddenly cuts to the next chapter where Paul and Gurney and Stilgar are walking into the Arakeen Palace. And then Paul goes and fights the Emperor and Fade. Like, D did I miss something? Did I miss the entire battle? And probably my biggest complaint of the entire book is that the book just sort of ends. Like, yes, we get the battle between Paul and Fade, but other than that, he just walks into the room, he goes, uh, Emperor Shaddam IV, give me all your, uh, holdings on the Chong Company and make me Emperor of the Known Universe, and I'm gonna marry Princess Erelon. And then that's it, like, the book just ends. But overall, Dune is a very great, influential sci-fi book. And no, it is not a white saviour story. It's literally about power and corruption and dictators and how you should not trust charismatic leaders like messiahs because they end up being corrupt and bad. Now granted, it does become a lot more explicit when you get to Dune Messiah, but that's not to say it doesn't have precedent in this book too, because I mean, every time the chapter opens with one of Irulan's writings, a lot of ways it hints at Paul Atreides' darker turn. Like, for example, the the phrase Muad'Dib says, God created Arrakis to train the faithful. That is the most militant, fundamentalist sounding thing ever. Like, it is dangerous and scary, and I don't get how people go, oh, Paul Atreides is a white saviour. Like, no, Paul Atreides unleashes a jihad. And the worst thing about it is that he knows he's burdened with terrible purpose, and he does nothing to stop said jihad. And if you didn't get Paul's darker turn through Irulan's writings, I mean, Gurney literally has a line in the last chapter where he's like, since when did an Atreides care about things than the lives of people? It shows Paul Atreides has changed and not for the better. But I digress. Is Dune the greatest science fiction novel ever written? Sure, yeah, I, I don't know, I don't read a lot of sci-fi, but I know that it's a very great influential book. I mean, there's so much Star Wars in this, there's so much Blade Runner in this, there's even a lot of Game of Thrones in this, and like, it, it's hard to deny the impact it's had on the science fiction genre, and just books in general. It's a very influential, well-written book that can be a bit of a slog at times because of how deep and dense it is, but then you also appreciate how deep and dense it is too, because I mean, most authors strive to be this detailed with their novels. Like, you want terminology, you want lore, you want history, and Dune has that. But what are your thoughts on Dune? Have you read the book, or have you just watched the video of me just basically spoiling every character, plot, element, and main theme from the novel without having actually, like, cared for the book? Are you excited for the new movie? Have you watched the David Lynch film? Let me know in the comments down below. Like, subscribe, follow me on social media, all that good stuff. And until we meet again, see you guys next time.